How's it going everybody? So in this video, we're going to have a casual discussion about why some of the many reasons why uh, a lot of people report having more energy, uh, having better mood, and just feeling overall like a light switch turned on when they went on a very low carb or ketogenic type diet or some kind of protocol that induces some state of deeper ketosis than people on a normal diet, okay? Uh, so a little bit of background, okay, for those who are not really familiar with low-carb or ketogenic diets. Um, we're talking specifically about any diet that will deplete liver glycogen enough to where your body starts to create endogenous sources of energy. Uh, such as ketones, and also, little known fact, that your body can actually convert um, free fatty acids and the glycerol backbone of triglycerides, as well as uh, other substances like pyruvate and lactate into either ATP or glucose molecules, as well as refilling glycogen from one of those sources. Uh, and to me, it's insane how many people either don't know that or kind of like push that under the rug and insist that you need exogenous sources of carbohydrates. Uh, coming from somebody who trains athletes and somebody who's competed multiple times on a ketogenic or carnivore type diet with very low or sometimes no carbohydrates. And I've also competed on a diet very high in carbs. Uh, I can tell the difference. Okay. So anyway. Um, forget all that. So it is very, very common for, uh, at least I see pretty frequently in, in forums, uh, things like Reddit, uh, Facebook communities, which I think are very important sources of anecdotes, uh, that are very valuable. Okay. Um, and also obviously there's a lot of YouTubers that come out and, and kind of mention this. Uh, for mood disorders and things like that, uh, things like bipolar disorder, uh, which I was actually diagnosed with when I was young with a severe case of bipolar disorder, um, <laughs> in addition to a couple other things, but I never talk about those things because no one would even be able to tell in my adult life that I ever, you know, had those things, but um, because I actually was able to remedy myself, <laughs> unlike most people. So anyway, um, yeah, so mood disorders, things like bipolar disorder, especially things like depression and severe depression, things like anxiety, um, and even insomnia. Like for myself, uh, I notice my sleep dramatically improves in a ketogenic state. Uh, people talk about how ketogenic diets for somehow within the first, usually within the first week, sometimes two weeks. For me, it's in the first couple days. Uh, it's like a fog that's normally over my brain just completely is lifted. Uh, a lot of times I'll just have this really weird like sense of fatigue in the background where I just, I feel very lethargic. And it mostly seems to be uh, in relation to uh, foods that are that uh, spike my insulin or something to that nature things that will raise my blood sugar um, rather abnormally within a, 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 a certain period of time uh, but especially carbohydrates and especially carbs in the refined sense so I find that I can consume uh, like low glycemic load fruits with bananas as the exception um, with meat and stuff like that and be okay. I don't consume fruits or any kind of carb sources by themselves. All, uh, at least when I'm to feel, you know, healthy, although, um, very frequently over the last like two years or so, I've experimented with honey, uh, especially around workouts. And I have found from my honey experiments that, I feel the worst when I consume honey in isolated periods. 
Uh, there have been times where I tried, like I tried an experiment, and this one might sound stupid to some people, where I just tried nothing but, like I tried honey with my morning coffee, sometimes with cream, and sometimes with egg yolks and cream, and then honey just like throughout the day with coffee, and then I've also tried it just around workouts, okay? And from what I've found, uh, if I use honey specifically after a workout, at the end of the day, I'm fine, okay? And I think that's because liver glycogen is depleted, your body's heavily sensitive to carbohydrates, and hypothetically speaking and mechanistically speaking, your body is in this, uh, a condition where after a hard training session, I'm talking, I'm talking jujitsu, not weightlifting. Doing powerlifting training and bodybuilding, in my opinion, is not that glycogen depleting in that same way. Uh, unless you're doing a bunch of drop sets with low rest, which doesn't make sense for muscle gain, side note. Uh, but for jujitsu training, I'm like going as hard as I can a lot of times, multiple rounds, little rest. Uh, it's excruciating physically, or it can be, depending on who you roll with. But anyway, after a jujitsu session, taking a little bit of honey, and I'm good to go. Uh, now, after a couple weeks of a strict ketogenic diet, especially along with uh, like fat, like 20 hour fasting where I trained while I'm fasted. And I find I can get away with honey before my 6 PM jujitsu session. I'm talking anywhere from two to four tablespoons. Okay. Now this is in the context of being an athlete. Okay. But I have found without fail, if I consume honey, especially by itself in the morning or just like throughout the day without training or even with training. Like there have been times where I'll do honey with my morning coffee and then I'll go and do my lifting and stuff like that. And I notice I'm less focused. My brain is more scattered and I feel instantly that why well, feel lethargic within one to three hours after that honey dose. And it always freaking happens compared to when I just, when I fast for 20, 20 hours and I might eat whatever carbs I'm eating preferably things like berries and maybe peaches and stuff like that with my meat uh, at the end of my 20 hour fasting period after I've already trained multiple times during that fasting period. Um, like I feel way better when I train fasted or, or at the very least when I don't consume carbs. Like I have found over and over again that that is the case. So anyway, uh, this is really common. You'll see it in, in lots of uh, these uh, tribes of people in keto, carnivore land. So let's kind of talk about this, okay? What are some of the mechanisms involved? What's possibly going on here? So the very first thing, and I think this is the most kind of like obvious, but also you could say the most bro science-ish, most pseudoscientific, would be kind of like the crashes from carbohydrates that a lot of people report getting. Even people who are part of the, you know, mainstream nutrition type paradigm, uh, even vegan land who are already eating a high carb diet, it's pretty commonly noted that like refined carbs, especially, um, especially by themselves, especially in large doses will give you like a crash. Um, and even if you take it before exercise, a lot of people report that. And so, of course, they'll say, well, do complex carbs instead. It won't give you the same crash. And it's like there's a whole rabbit hole to go down. Number one, like it takes a lot longer to digest complex carbs than most people realize. You don't just eat oatmeal before you work out and it's ready for energy like within three hours. That's why honey is a better option, but it has more of a crash. Um, it takes quite a number of hours before that those whole grains turn into energy. For one, they're not even digested in, until they hit the uh, intestine, which they're digested by bacterial fermentation, which is why you fart when you eat those foods. Um, anyway, and it's funny though. People are like, yeah, man, I eat my oatmeal for energy before workouts. Like, bro, it doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't work that way. Oh my God. And then they're like, well, you can't fast because you need energy throughout the day. It's like, well, actually... Your body's using whatever foods you ate the night before, generally, because that's how energy metabolism and digestion works. It takes a long time. <clears throat> anyway, 
Uh, so hyperinsulinemia, I think, could be to blame. I think for whatever reason, there are some people that might just be uh, like they have a very sensitive insulin response. That might be an explanation, like where they consume, you know, like a, uh, a bolus of honey and their insulin response is just so on the dot that it just it spikes so high to rid itself of that that honey for whatever reason and then you end up with lower blood sugar uh than before because the insulin response is so high and your blood sugar goes super super low below baseline and then you get all the symptoms of low blood sugar um and high insulin in general uh like especially in the short term can make you feel pretty bad now this of course is going to be heavily debated now i am not trying to say anything about fat loss and insulin causing like that is obviously been debunked over and over again insulin in relation to fat loss um without considering calories in versus calories out but as far as energy dips and uh being lethargic and stuff like that i think it probably plays a role um and, I, and again, let me just say, without a doubt, without fail, when I consume a large amount of carbs, especially something like uh, honey, and even I've had cases of jasmine rice where I just eat way too much and I feel bad as hell, uh, pretty damn, like I want to take a, hor like a nap or whatever, but I can't because I'm so restless. Um, so, and I've tried a lot of experiments. There's going to be dumbass people in the comments who will leave me like, really obvious uh statements and like oh well you're doing it wrong or how about you do this and it's like they're talking as if i'm some kind of newbie or something when yeah it's like denning kruger for them at least but uh i hate when people do that it's so fucking annoying anyway um so there's other things that could possibly be at play uh it could it could not even be the carbs per se it might be the effects of ketogenic metabolism. Here's one a lot of people haven't thought of. Now, I personally think it's probably a, a carbohydrate thing, with me at least, because it, it's an acute thing. Literally, if I just stop consuming carbs for a day, I notice I feel way fucking better, pretty fast. But I do notice over time, the effects start to build and build and build, where the longer I go without carbohydrates and maybe consuming a little bit of berries and fruit at the very end of the day with my meat after already training fasted for like 20 hours, I'm fine. Right. And the effects build up over time. But if I consume white rice during that time or any kind of like high amount of carbs, provided I don't eat whole grains or beans or nuts or seeds because digestion, um, I mentioned before IBS, psoriasis, but uh, honey, blah, 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 shit like that, especially during the day, absolute nonsense, kills me, whatever. <laughs> if I consume it after a training session, after I already fasted, I usually, I'll be all right, actually. Um, might hydrate me better, right? But effects build up over time. So I do think it might be a side effect of carbohydrate consumption, uh, especially the wrong type taken at the wrong time and the wrong doses. But I also think uh, so without it, like, it's a fact that ketogenic metabolism has some unique benefits shown mechanistically. How they play out in humans is up for debate. Uh, but there are a lot of benefits of ketogenic metabolism that people aren't aware of. So one of the first ones is that beta-hydroxybutyrate is anti-inflammatory. Um, its presence in the blood can actually, um, and also... There's a, there's a dose-dependent response uh, between beta-hydroxybutyrate in the blood and uh, markers of inflammation. Of course, this is variable, and there is a cutoff point. It's actually a bell curve where at the higher end of beta-hydroxybutyrate, obviously, you have <laughs> ketoacidosis in pathogenic uh, amounts, right? Uh, but that's not what I'm talking about here. Uh, there are multiple mechanisms of um, how beta-hydroxybutyrate might do this. One of the biggest ones is that uh, when you are metabolizing energy endogenously, it tends to create less 
pro-inflammatory byproducts, and specifically we're talking about free, uh, free, radical, uh, free radicals in response to energy metabolism. Uh, reactive oxygen species are going to be uh, produced less or in less amounts when you're in ketogenic metabolism. And for a greater kind of like outlook on some of the things I'm about to talk about, uh, there's a really good book. It's a very short read, but it's basically a summary of um, Dr. Stephen Finney and Jeff Volok and their, you know, 200 or more uh, studies that they conducted together over the last like 40 years or so on ketogenic metabolism. It's called The Art and Science of Low Carbohydrate Performance, and it's the most, it's very complicated unless you don't have like a master's level education in physiology or energy metabolism in some degree, right? I do recommend reading that no matter what you believe, but especially if you're kind of like, oh, I call bullshit on this guy. So anyway, um, not only producing less free radical, uh, free radical species, reactive oxygen species, but there are... Um, amino acid sparing effects, including uh, what seems to be a more uh, an upregulation recycling of leucine uh, in the blood when uh, during ketogenic metabolism, there seems to be a protein sparing effect, um, which is great, especially if you're in a calorie deficit. And it might explain why a lot of people who do these fasting protocols or ketogenic diets report feeling less hungry and feeling less stressed and being able to maintain a caloric deficit um, without some of the commonly reported kind of negative side effects of prolonged caloric deficits that a lot of people talk about. Low energy, low mood, sleep disturbances, uh, and constant hunger. It might have to do with the protein sparing effect and the upregulation or recycling of BCAAs and leucine that can happen from ketogenic metabolism. Um, and so there seems to be uh, a greater rate of protein synthesis, at least in prolonged ketogenic uh, interventions. We're talking longer than four weeks, which let me remind everyone, one of the main reasons why we find a lot of negative findings with ketogenic diets is because is when we're use, we're, you know, biased people that are biased towards carbohydrate being necessary. And we're using studies that are less than three weeks or so. You don't find these beneficial effects because just like with, a, with an untrained sedentary people doing a, a strength training protocol, people who are adapted to carbohydrate metabolism who are suddenly put on a ketogenic diet, they're going to have all sorts of like negative, irregular kind of metabolic symptoms and markers. You'll see acutely performance might go down. Stress markers might go up. You have a greater uh, rate of perceived exertion because your body has not adapted yet. But just like with a repeated bout effect and exercise, the longer someone does strength training, the more their body adapts. And you see changes in all of the markers that are tested in untrained people at first. The same thing goes for uh, ketogenic metabolism. Like your body is literally making physical changes that are measurable uh in the short term and the long term where your body's actually it needs to completely shift its metabolic functions um and the way it creates energy over time so using short-term studies to measure you know like protein synthesis and muscle breakdown and stuff is not a good thing um you have to look at the long-term studies which is why Stephen Finney and Jeff Follock um, are seen as like the greatest researchers in the field of low-carb metabolism because they pioneered this research and they're the ones who figured this out. Um, and furthermore, most of these studies use, they restrict protein way, way too much. They're doing like 90% fat protocols. And if you follow the science on ketogenic metabolism, you realize you can maintain nutritional ketosis, meaning, you know, which is defined as Blood, ketone, blood ketones over 0.5 millimole per, de per deciliter with 65 or 70 percent fat, really 35 percent uh, protein as a portion of calories. Um, that is a pretty high amount of protein for a ketogenic protocol, and you can maintain 
nutritional ketosis just fine in that regard for people who are training and exercising and they're looking for performance and mood boosting benefits they might find that higher protein intake is better and the defining factor here to maintain ketosis is not fat or protein intake but more so the depletion of liver glycogen via carbohydrate restriction uh, and eventually your body starts to refill liver glycogen more efficiently through endogenous sources after a while anyway um, so yeah, greater BCA recycling, uh, greater um, or le uh, gr more efficiency in energy metabolism to where there is less uh, free radicals being produced from energy metabolism. Uh, and so then of course the, the big thing like I mentioned earlier is just you don't have those spikes of insulin and spikes of blood sugar and the crashes that usually follow throughout the course of the day. So your blood sugar remains more stable throughout the day and your insulin level is more stable throughout the day. It's possible that some people are a lot more sensitive for whatever reason to those ebbs and flows of blood sugar. And for me personally, I think that's probably the biggest thing is for whatever reason, when I have a higher spike in blood sugar or a higher spike in insulin, I just feel like crap. And then I have the crash and it's terrible. And uh, I have, I've historically had a lot of the symptoms of like high or low blood sugar present themselves. I've had everything from the shakes and the sweats, bloody fucking vision, uh, or not bloody vision, damn it. But <laughs> that would be horrible. Oh, my eyes are bleeding. Fucking carbs. No, no. Uh, but blurry vision pretty extensively. Breathing issues were pretty bad for a long time. Uh, I had a doctor even kind of like scare the crap out of me and call me a day after ta or a couple days after taking my blood telling me to get in his office ASAP because he said I had diabetes full blown and I needed to treat it. But then he like took it back when I went to his office, which is weird. Um, and I never really went for a full evaluation after that. And I just took matters in my own hands. But I've had a lot of symptoms of like diabetes for a very long time and I mean it could have been the medications I was on as a child that just created a medication induced kind of type 1 diabetes situation who knows uh, I have actually gotten my blood sugar tested and stuff like that since then uh, but they did mostly like a it was something like a four hour urinalysis or something to make sure I wasn't pissing out uh, sugar or something to that extent something that wasn't really as extensive enough to really diagnose it but um, anyway whatever the whatever the case is it seems to be a direct response to the ebbs and flows of blood sugar um, so there's other things too though like beta hydroxybutyrate and uh, ketones they seem to upregulate GABA and lower glutamate and you know, so glutamate is basically a stimulatory neurotransmitter in the brain that uh, tends to like make you jittery. It tends to make you anxious. It tends to make you feel mentally sick. And I think that it, it's a prime. It plays. A, it definitely plays a primary role in things like epilepsy and seizures, which is and and, and ketogenic metabolism tends to downregulate glutamate and upregulate the expression of GABA, which is the inhibitory neurotransmitter makes you feel calm, makes you feel uh, serene and, and, and allows you to sleep and it calms down neural activity in the brain. And it's one of the primary mechanisms of uh, like the common amino acid people use as nootropic, L-theanine and even green tea. It calms you down. That's what GABA does. And so ketogenic diets and ketogenic, anything that pr promotes ketogenesis lowers glutamate and, and dramatically increases the expression of GABA. That's one of the main mechanisms that is proposed as to why ketogenic diets are a very effective treatment. Upwards of over 65% of cases of epilepsy and seizures. Uh, and there were some documented case reports in the literature on schizophrenia where they used ketogenic diets um, to get off their medications and put schizophrenia in remission. Although those studies, I think you might still be able to find their uh, placeholders in the literature. 
they seem to have been like the actual content of the study has been like hidden or deleted or something. And I don't know. I find that suspicious on regards to the journal because I've seen a lot of people kind of mention, echo that this has happened. And I wonder if maybe people just don't want that for whatever reason, because people might get off their meds. And that might be problematic, don't get me wrong. Like, you don't want people thinking they can cure their disease uh, with nutrition, get off their meds, because then they might have, like, a life-changing episode that might be very dramatically detrimental. So I think it's important for people to not put all their faith in, like, a nutritional means if they have life-crippling depression or schizophrenia. Like, that's not good, right? Like, we have to be really kind of grounded before we take drastic changes in our approach. So, uh, anyway, so there are people out there that are like completely reversing their mental health issues, uh, using ketogenic diets and myself included. And I think it has a lot to do with the GABA promoting expression of keto ketones and ketogenesis. And I think that there's something about carbohydrates and blood sugar fluctuations that promotes um, this instability in mood, instability in energy, and just kind of like ment mental, cognitive, and energetic chaos. And like you can go on all sorts of rabbit holes. You can talk about evolutionarily, like what did the body adapt to, which you have to take in consideration. Are we talking you know, a civilization in Asia, a civilization in the tropics, a civilization in the Arctic, right? Like, uh, I, I think claiming humans are adapted to fasting or humans are adapted to low-carb diets, I think that that is very nuanced and it is hyper-contextual, if that's a, a fucking word. Very much so depends on the context. Uh, I don't think appeal to nature is entirely a good kind of argument here. But I think for m many people that find success in ketogenic metabolism, it might be that your genetics are, you know, have, you know, positively responding. It could be for you and your specific genetic tree and your specific, what they have evolved to, right? Um, anyway... So, I mean, there's a lot more to talk about. There's things like uh, fluid metabolism that's shifted in ketogenic diets and whatnot. There is the upregulation of norepinephrine, which is kind of like a, for a catecholamine that is related to dopamine and adrenaline that uh, increases focus, increases kind of like your motivation and stuff. And that is upregulated specifically in regards to prolonged fasting especially if you exercise during fasting because exercise increases norepinephrine in that short period after where you feel the supposed like endorphin rush. A lot of that might be catecholamines being produced and it kind of like motivates you to seek food, right? Um, your senses are sharpened, things like that. And I think that, that might have something to do with it. Also, you know, you have like the talk about autophagy uh, and like the uh, hormetic response of like a stress, you know, the stresses that ketogenic diets might impose on the metabolism. The fact is keto, keto, your body does adapt eventually, just like anything, just like when you go out in the sun in short periods of time, eventually your body gets tan and you build up a resilience to a certain degree of sun. And there is kind of like a drop off period, a drop off. It's not like you can just forever like tan yourself. You'll be burnt to a crisp. Um, you know, sauna and heat exposure. There's only a certain degree of heat that your body can adapt to. But, you know, before you melt, right? Unless your body can adapt to that too, we'd just fucking live on Mars or whatever. <laughs> or whatever it is. Live on the fucking sun one day, right? Um, I'm sure there's, you know, maybe there are already humans that have done that, right? Uh, but they are so advanced, they don't come back to Earth. But anyway, um, yeah, so I think even with in regards to autophagy and like ketosis being stressful, I think this idea that, Oh shit, if you just like are in ketosis for like a year, you know, there's, there's this talk about stress hormones being, uh, upregulated. 
And I just don't think that's the case. I think that that's like somebody who wants to believe that carbs are necessary and that ket ketosis is harmful. They want to say it's stress hormones. I just don't think that's the case. Um, number one, you know, you have these supposed neurodegenerative diseases that, uh, you, you know, mechanistically and hypothetically you would think would respond negatively to stress hormones and things, things like, uh, Parkinson's, uh, depression, um, uh, epilepsy and these things that most, a lot of people use ketogenic diets to kind of remedy and they're out there trying to say, you know, stress hormones are why ketosis is so effective for mental performance. And I just don't think that's the case, uh, especially considering my sleep dramatically improves when I go on ketogenic diets. Uh, maybe high carb is just more stressful, right, for me. And keto is still stressful, supposedly. And that's why I can sleep when I remove carbs. I don't know. Um, there are a lot of people, though, that do say low carb diets mess with their sleep, but there's a lot of nuance in that discussion as well. Um, and these people who say, oh, like they, they get weaker when they go on keto. And I think that that's a lot of placebo effect, and people don't know how to train properly. So they lower their volume because they're like, oh, fuck, I'm not eating carbs. Therefore, I can't train as much. And when you lower your volume, you're going to get weaker, like no matter what you're eating. And I think that that is actually to blame for a lot of their problems. Because for me, I've actually gotten stronger when I first went on keto. Like with my Olympic lifts, I started doing Olympic lifts for reps. My, my three rep max on clean and jerk provided rep maxes wasn't something I did for, you know, but I just started to get this, like my three rep max clean and jerk became a nine rep max in literally like three weeks. So I was like, wow, this is weird. <laughs> uh, you know, so it shouldn't have happened, bro, but it did. All right. Keto makes carnivore makes you weak, bro. You need fucking carbs. And I'm like, nope, I'm like a beast all of a sudden. Right. And without fail, my training performance has improved on keto. Like, without fail. Like, like the last month, my training's been a disaster. And I've been eating, you know, like a pretty close to, like, the evidence-based recommendations um, of carbohydrate, protein, and fat intake. Like, and I just, the longer I do carbs, the worse I feel. And the longer I do a keto protocol, the better I feel. So, anyway... This has been a really scattered video. If y'all really want like a more dialed down video where I have timestamps and I use a, an actual like outline, let me know and I'll do it like point by point. Um, but I like to just kind of think out loud and get my thoughts out there. So if this is the type of video you like, let me know. Let me know that I'm not just like wasting my time kind of vomiting out my thoughts and that these videos are actually interesting to y'all. Because uh, I can make a lot more videos like this. The outline thing I could do is going to come out better. But, like, for me, it's just o more overwhelming. Um, even though it probably won't be as time-consuming as I think. But, anyway, I don't know. Uh, all I know is uh, here's my practical kind of recommendations I use for my clients and that I find works best is I wake up, I drink my, my coffee, my tonic herbs, uh, you know, amazing stuff. Literally have no carbs or caloric stuff throughout that fasting window. Although I think, you know, for the, for the purpose of energy, the purpose of mental clarity, a little bit of like coconut oil or MCT oil is probably not a bad idea because that actually tends to improve the feelings you get during that fasting period and maybe some, some protein powder along with it. If, you know, you notice that you feel better. But for me, I, I don't do any of that. I might do MCT, MCT oil sometimes, but I haven't done that in months, really. So, like, literally no, no calories except for whatever microscopic amount of calories I might get from my tonic herbs or if I add maca or cacao to my thing, it might add under 10 grams of net carbs, right? Anyway, I go fucking train. I do my strength and conditioning. I'll do my jujitsu if I have time for it for whatever, you know, whatever my, it is going. So I'll do like a strength and conditioning in the morning, jujitsu at like 11, at, you know, noon or whatever. And then, you know, obviously I do all my work. I do my school. I do train my clients. 
And then like 6 p.m. comes around. I'll do another jiu-jitsu session. And I go fucking ham. Uh, and then after that, usually if I'm training at my regular place, I'll come home at like maybe 8 p.m. And I'll eat a pound of meat with like a pound of berries or a half pound of berries. Maybe, maybe, you know, whatever mixed fruit, like maybe some mangoes, maybe whatever. And then, and then around, you know, 10 p.m. or something, I might have, I'll, I'll usually have another pound of meat, oftentimes with another half pound to a pound of like berries or something like that, right? And literally the net carb count does not go over 50 grams, depending on what type of fruit I'm eating. Uh, might might come up to 80 grams, right? Uh, and keep in mind, I literally fasted the entire day. I trained like three times during the fucking day. So without a shadow of a doubt, I'm in ketosis. And when I've measured blood ketones, they're over one, uh, one, one mil, millimole per deciliter or whatever. So I'm definitely in pretty deep ketosis at that point. Sometimes 1.5. Especially when I wake up the next morning, I'm at like 1.5 or more, uh, sometimes up to 2.5. And that's pretty deep ketosis, really. Uh, so there's no like arbitrary like amount of carbs you need to maintain ketosis. Um, but, you know, I've done periods of time, obviously, like the first two years of, of my keto and carnivore thing where I did like no fucking carbs at all, right? Besides what I might get out of an avocado. Or a keto like, you know, bread or something. Um, and there's been times like, for example, during my last competition prep where I, I did some days where I targeted some honey before my training. And uh, I honestly find the most important thing is that my body does not have insane spikes of sugar or insulin for whatever reason. Because even during ketosis, if it's before training... If I take too much honey before training, I'll notice like a lack of focus and some weird like brain fog and lethargy. So, so yeah. Anyway, I'm just going to leave you guys with that. Um, you know what I mean? And like, remember, I, I experiment quite often. So in the future, I might do another carb experiment. Who knows? But uh, yeah, so I'm going to leave it at that and we'll talk next time. Let me know what you guys think in the comments.